Todd? Yes. Recording in progress. Okay. I just want to start by saying uh, that I'm not one of those authors, writers who takes these kind of invitations for granted, who thinks it's an honor for you to be hearing what I have to say today. Uh, I feel it's uh, just the opposite. It's an honor for me to hear what you have to say. And so I just want to make it clear up front that uh, I'm very appreciative of this opportunity to talk to you uh, as we uh, are tiptoeing into the waters of uh, Women's History Month. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about this extraordinary woman uh, who far too few people know about, but there's lots of uh, evidence to suggest that's changing. And uh, we wanna keep, keep that uh, uh, circle growing because this truly was somebody that we should know about, that we should know about. So that said, what I'm gonna do is talk to you for about 35 minutes on why I would wake up at three o'clock in the morning obsessed with uh, all biographers, if they are worth a damn, you have to be obsessed with the person you're writing about. This is my Moby Dick. I would wake up at three o'clock in the morning obsessing over a sentence. When I was teaching um, narrative writing at the University of Nebraska in the opening three hour block of uh, the discussion, I would cherry pick the 12 best students we had and get them in this narrative nonfiction class and teach them how to use all of the techniques of nonfiction writers, but run it through a fiction strain so that you're telling a story instead of reporting a story. And one of the most important aspects of learning that lesson is that good music and good writing are synonymous. If you take good music and superimpose it over good writing, it should be a tight, snug fit. It's about beat, rhythm, cadence, syncopation. Those words should move across the page in the same way that notes move across a musical score. So I would be obsessing at three o'clock in the morning over a sentence or two sentences or three sentences that I had written 12 hours earlier about Susan LaFleche, whom I was obsessed with and wanted to get everything perfect. And I would be wanting that sentence to sound like Luciano Pavarotti. And the more I would lay in bed and twist and turn, it started to sound like Roseanne Barr singing the Star Spangled Banner. And I defy anybody to try and sleep through that. So I didn't, I would just get up and I would go down and I would start fiddling with it until at least I'd got it tilted more towards Luciano and away from Roseanne. Um, Susan LaFleche. In 1890, in 1890, the year of the Wounded Knee Massacre, there were 104,805 licensed physicians in the United States of America. 4.4% of whom were women. And of that small number, 4.4% who were women, only one, only one of those women was a Native American woman. And her name was Susan LaFleche, the youngest of four daughters of the last recognized chief of the Omaha tribe. And in the language of her people, the Omaha, that literally means going against the current. Omaha means in their language, going against the current, going upstream. And that's what Susan did for the half century that she was on the planet. All 50 years of her life, she was going upstream. She was going against the current. This is a woman who at the height of the Victorian era was born in an animal skin teepee, was born in a buffalo hide teepee on the Western High Plains of Nebraska, born in a teepee in near the Wyoming border. And 24 years later, walked across the stage in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and accepted a medical degree from the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania. Interestingly enough, the only medical college, not in the United States, not in Pennsylvania, not in the East Coast, the only medical college in the world at the height of the Victorian era where a woman could walk in the front door of the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania and three years later walk out the back door with a medical degree in her hand. So Susan had classmates from all over the world. There were 38 in her class. One classmate was from New Delhi. 
One classmate was from Damascus, Syria. One classmate was from Tokyo, Japan. And then there was this little girl who was born in an animal skin teepee who walked across that stage on March 14th, 1889 to accept her medical degree as the valedictorian of her class, competing against the very wealthy daughters of some of the industrial tycoons, the Wanamakers, some of the tycoons up and down the East Coast. But it was the, it was the young native woman from a Buffalo High teepee who was the valedictorian of the class. And her friends who had got her in the door, her teachers at the, at the medical college, her classmates from the East Coast, they begged her upon graduation to stay. Stay on the East Coast, stay in Philadelphia, Boston, Hartford, New York. You can live a charmed life. You can have a Victorian home with gingerbread trim. You can go to museums, art galleries, concertos, poetry readings, all things that Susan loved. She could quote Shakespeare at length and also was fluent in five languages. She never gave that any thought. Her goal from the age of eight, when she sat in a half-lit room of an elderly Omaha woman and watched her slowly die throughout the night, despite the fact that they had sent for the white reservation doctor three times, and each time he said he was on his way, he never showed up. And eight-year-old Susan watched in horror as this elderly Omaha woman died this agonizing death at dawn the next day. There, as I tell my students, there is often a seminal moment in our lives that alters the trajectory of our lives. You can look in your own life and probably find that moment. But in many, many cases, there is a turning point. There is a moment in which the trajectory of your life is altered. And for Susan, it was then, and she writes about that in her journal and in her diaries. That's what propelled her on this improbable journey from a Buffalo Hyde teepee to the valedictorian of her class in Philadelphia. But she rebuffed all of these sincere offers to stay put on the East Coast and, and have this cultured life. She got on the next train back to Omaha. Her father, the last recognized chief of the Omaha tribe, met her in a buckboard in Omaha in the summer of 1879 and drove her back about 80 miles north to the Omaha reservation where she would spend the rest of her life devoted, devoted to her people. Um, at age 24, this young woman inherited 1,244 patients. Do you know any doctors who have 1,200 patients? And they were scattered across this vast reservation, 1,350 square mile reservation with 1,244 patients. Susan would get up at five o'clock in the morning, walk the football length to the barn where she would hitch up her favorite uh, chocolate mares, Pam and Pudge, hitch them up to a buckboard wagon. And I know all of this granular detail, molecular detail, the DNA of her life because thank God she was a almost slavish diarist and journalist. So I have all of her journals, I have all of her diaries. And I know that she would make that walk every morning. Often it was five below, there was eight inches of snow on the ground and she had gotten some vague instructions from a distant relative three days earlier, two days earlier, that if you go, this was before Google Maps, that if you go two miles north on Omaha Creek, then there'll be a cottonwood tree and you go west another mile, and then there will be a deep ravine and take that ravine and climb up the hill another three miles. And on top of that hill will be a log cabin with a plume of smoke coming out of it. Inside will be a 14 year old girl curled up in a fetal position on a dirt floor in the corner, dying of tuberculosis. And the only thing standing between that 14 year old girl and death was Susan LaFleche. And she would spend 14, 16, 18 hours a day canvassing this enormous reservation, 
people who have diseases they had never had before because of contact with white settlers, influenza, tuberculosis, on and on and on and on with very little protection against that. They had no antibodies, they had no resistance. And she would come home night after night after night after having spent 18 hours and seen only two or three families because of the great distances apart. And many of her diary entries would end, went to bed supperless, too tired to eat. Would get up at five o'clock the next day and do it again. So I wanna just tell you in a sense how I decided to structure this story. You have to have a game plan. I spent close to a year and a half just researching. That's what I do. That's what I did for 15 years, uh, was investigative reporting in New York and Miami, two places where there was a lot to investigate. Uh, so you just have to learn how to do it, how to get records, how to get data, how to talk to people, how to uh, conduct interviews because everybody's different. One person responds much differently than another. So I spent a year and a half of taking in effect uh, a uh, Hoover vacuum cleaner and kicking it up to high and taking that venue, that 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 Hoover va uh, vacuum cleaner and just running it over the entire landscape of all things Susan. That included trips to innumerable historical societies, um, the National Archives in Washington D.C., tracking down relatives and getting their oral history of the tribe and how Susan fit into it and what their stories were about her. Uh, and that vacuum cleaner was on for a year and a half. And then you shut it off. And then you open up the bag and you dump it on the table and you want to faint. There is this absolute Mount Everest mound of information that you have collected and you've got to have a game plan. How am I going to take this mountain of information that took a year and a half to gather, how am I going to sculpt it into a beginning and a middle and an end that's compelling enough to keep the reader after page five from getting up and taking Fido for a walk or after page 10, going to the golf course and hitting a round of nine irons? What strategy can I impose on this mound of information to keep that reader reading, turning the page, and learning things about an extraordinary woman that she'd never heard of before. A woman who, like I said, on March 14th, 1889, became the first Native American doctor, not the first female American, the first Native American doctor, period. 31 years, 31 years. She had her medical degree, spoke five languages, could quote Romeo and Juliet at length, but it would be another 31 years before she could vote in her own country. And it really wasn't her own country because it would be another 35 years before her country decided she was good enough or qualified enough to become a citizen and to have voting rights on lands that her people had lived upon for 10,000 years. So how are you gonna tell this story? What's different? What's unique? The first, what I eventually decided to do after examining this mountain of information was to take this story and to balance it on three thematic pillars. The first thematic pillar was going to be, everybody knows about the American West. The American West is a mythical landscape. People in Siberia know about the American West. People in China know about the American West. People in Peru, Colombia, Portugal, everybody knows about the American West. How do they know about the American West? Okay, I'm back in my professor role asking questions and, and, and expecting answers. This is not a passive talk. I wanna hear, how do people in Peru know about the American West? Like I tell my students, no, no dumb answers. Movies. Movies. <laughs> Westerns. Westerns. Books. Books. I'm talking to A students, obviously. Songs. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. The editor, the editor of this book, A Warrior of the People, 
the editor of this book is the Western History Acquisitions Editor for St. Martin's Press, one of the 10 most powerful publishing houses in the United States. They occupy the top two floors of the Flatiron Building in Midtown Manhattan, about 23rd and 5th Avenue, that iconic triangular shaped pie, pie wedge shaped building. Uh, they're on the top two floors. Her name is Daniela Rapp. Daniela Rapp, and she's from Stuttgart, Germany. And I wanted to know one sultry August day when we were talking about the book project, how in the hell does a German woman from Stuttgart, Germany, end up as the Western History Acquisitions Editor for one of the 10 most powerful publishing houses in the United States? And she said, my entire family, including my grand grandparents, were addicted to your Westerns. <laughs> we watched Gunsmoke all the time. We watched Paladin and Have Gun Will Travel all the time. What do you think was their favorite Western? There was one that stood out above the rest. It was like uh, listening to Daniela was close to like a heroin addiction. There was no way anybody was going to miss this. And what she also said is that in Germany, when she was growing up watching the Westerns with all of her German classmates, they did not use subtitles. They dubbed everything from English into high German. So any guesses as to the number one ranked Western in the rap household in Stuttgart, Germany? Maverick. Good guess, but not the right grit. Good guess, but not the right one. Okay, Corral. Good guess, I'm but fight. not quite the right one. Bonanza. Ah. TV Bonanza. show. Okay. And I, she told me that when we were sitting in Greenwich Village drinking coffee, and I had this image of walking into her apartment right. and seeing this big TV screen and seeing that it was Haas Cartwright on the screen and getting closer and closer and hearing Haas Cartwright speaking fluent high German. My memory of Haas is he struggled mightily with English. He only had about an eight word vocabulary and now he's speaking high German. So what I wanna do with this book, we know about the American West because it's forever, for well over a century, the image of the American West has been refracted through the lens of men. We know about the American West because of Haas Cartwright and Buffalo Bill Cody and Wild Bill Hickok and George Armstrong Custer and Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull and Paladin. The view, the global view of the American West, mythical and otherwise, has been shaped almost exclusively through the eyes of men. So when you walk up those steps and you get to the top one and you have this panoramic view of the American West, what you see is what has been presented to you in books and movies and TV through the eyes of men. I wanted to flip the script. I wanted to get all of you and everybody else to walk up those same steps, get to the top step, look out that same panoramic view and see what this mythical landscape, the American West looked like through the eyes of a woman. And not just any woman, an amazing woman, unlike any other this country has produced. What does that American West look like? To me, when I sorted through everything that I had combed out of that Hoover vacuum cleaner bag, it's a much different American West. It's a much more emotionally complex landscape. Susan LaFleche in diary entry after diary entry talks about 5 a.m., 10 below, foot of snow, pitch dark, being all alone with a buffalo robe slung around her shoulders, going across this frozen prairie in the dark, looking for that curling plume of smoke, and she would be overwhelmed with these panic attacks. Sometimes they would be so severe, she would just have to stop in the middle of nowhere. And she was terrified. 
that she, among other things, that she might die alone. That she might never have a husband. She might never have children. She might never have a family. And these were really, really powerful, palpable emotions that she expressed in her diaries and her journals to the point where she could not move. She couldn't move the buggy. She just had to wait it out until that panic attack let up and she could focus and get on with looking for that 14 year old girl. That's a whole different American West. I don't have everything that Custer or Crazy Horse or Buffalo Bill Cody have uh, ever expressed, but I have never come across anything that suggested they had panic attacks because they were afraid they were going to die alone and they were never going to have children. And to this day, children are still the strongest self-identifying characteristic for Native women. And this haunted Susan, this haunted Susan. She eventually did have a husband and she eventually did have a family, two wonderful young boys, Pierre and Carol. And she loved them beyond all rational boundaries, of course, like every mother. And so she would stay home and take care of Pierre and Carol. And when she did, she felt so good as a mother, but she felt terrible as a doctor because she wasn't seeing her patients. So she would hand the two little boys over to her husband and get back in the buggy and start off on these 18 hour days and come back exhausted. And she felt really great as a doctor, but horrible as a mother. Now, mercifully, in the opening decades of the 21st century, women have now easily figured out how to integrate family and jobs, right? I'm being a smart ass. <laughs> I don't think from what I know that that's a very smooth, simple issue of balancing family and career. Even now, certainly wasn't in Susan's era, but she did her best struggling between, this is what I need to do as a doctor. I've got 1,200 patients. This is what I need to do as a mother. I have two sons. And it was always a very complicated task. And this is a different view of the American West. And to me, it's a much more interesting one than, hi, Pa, I'll go saddle the horses. And away goes Haas. All right, well, I don't want to beat up on Haas too much here, but uh, I thought this was a little bit more interesting, uh, the view of the American West when you, when, you, when you tunnel into Susan's psyche and her emotions and all the things that she had to balance as a mother and as a doctor of 1,200 patients and this uh, no roads, no highways, no computers, just her in a buggy. The second theme... The second pillar that I wanted to balance this book on was absolutely indispensable to you, the reader, to understand Susan LaFleche. And that is my job is to put her into a historical context. If I present this story devoid of the historical context, much of the power and the richness of this story is stripped out of it. And that is like a literary felony. I should go to prison if I were to write a book and not have the historical context. You need to know the dimensions and the strength of the current that Susan was swimming against, the tide that she was swimming against, all of the forces that were pushing her back to shore saying, you're a woman, how dare you? get an education. How dare you try and become a doctor? How dare you learn five languages? All of these were in play at the height of the Victorian era. It was thought, not by the cave dwellers and the knuckle draggers, but it was thought by the intellectual heavyweights, the best scientists of the era, 
and they wrote about this extensively, and I have it all in my files. They passionately believe, not all of them, but a shockingly high number of them, that women should never be allowed to go to college to get a university education. We're talking the 1870s, 1880s, into the 1890s. Some of the leading scientific lights, no, we cannot have women going to college. Why? Because the stress of university life will destroy their ovaries and render them infertile. And they will not be able to bear our children. So they need to stay home, take care of those children, keep that house clean, and keep those clothes clean. The disconnect between reality and what the scientific community was telling women in the last quarter of the 19th century was just staggering. And when you plow into the literature and you see, again, these were the Stephen Hawking's of the era. And I don't want you sitting here listening to me just rattle on to take my word for this. With your permission, I would just like to read a couple of snippets that go from the general to the very specific. Do I have your permission to do so? Yes? Okay. And you know, I'm not one of those writers who say, yes, I'm just gonna read a little bit and then two hours later you're asleep and I'm still I'm still reading. Those 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 people are out there, as you probably know. This will not be one of those cases. So here we go. Uh, well, I'm just going to start right, right from uh, the quote. This is, this is a quote. Quote, just therefore, as higher civilization is heralded, or at least evidenced by increasing bulk of brain, just as the most intelligent and the dominant races surpass their rivals in cranial capacity, and just as in those races, the leaders, where in the sphere of thought or of action are eminently large brained, so we must naturally expect that man, surpassing woman in volume of brain, must also per surpass her in at least a proportionate degree in intellectual power. End quote, proclaimed the December 1878 issue of Popular Science Monthly one of the most respected scientific journals of the Victorian era, not to be outdone by their American counterparts. We jump across the pond and embrace this startling entry from the Journal of the Anthropological Society of London. And I quote, during menstruation, women suffer under a languor and depression which disqualify them from thought or action and render it extremely doubtful how far they can be considered responsible human beings while the crisis endures. In intellectual labor, man has surpassed, does now, and always will surpass woman for the obvious reason that nature does not periodically interrupt his thought and activities. That's what Susan was up against. That's why there was only one medical college in the world, <laughs> not in the United States, in the world, that opened its front door to allow women in to become doctors. And me telling this story, you have to provide that historical context. You, to strip that out is to uh, see Susan as an island without the sea and the tides around her. And that, as I say, is a, a literary uh, indiscretion that is felonious. Uh, and it goes on and on, the documented evidence of what she was up against and how she overcame this. Always thinking of that eight-year-old Susan sitting in that room watching that woman die, and she was not going to let her people do that. And she didn't, she didn't. The third and final thematic pillar that I wanted to balance this narrative arc on, a beginning, a middle, and end, 
selecting what I thought were the three most important themes. But this is a this is a story about identity. And I believe I could adequately defend my position that I believe everything is about identity in the end. How we see ourselves. Who gets to determine who that person is? At midnight, when you look in the mirror and all the masks are gone and all the costumes are put away, who is that person staring back at you? And what were the tributaries that formed the narrative river of the self looking back from that mirror? Is it the state you were born in? Is it the city you were born in? The part of the city you were born in? The parents you uh, had and who raised you? Your siblings, the church, the mosque, the temple you prayed in, the teachers? Yeah, it's all of that. It's all of that. But what happens? What happens when a more powerful exterior force comes along and forbids you to speak your language and forbids you to practice your religion and forbids you to perform your cultural ceremonies, your dances, your songs, all of the things that form your identity are now illegal. And on the Pine Ridge Reservation, in the southwest corner of South Dakota, to this day, March of 2023, the poorest county in the United States, home of the Ogallala Lakota, crazy horses people. In 1882, if you were caught speaking Lakota, you could be put in jail for three days. If you were caught practicing your religion, you could be put in jail for two days. And these were enforced. So how do you know who you are? What happens when you send your children to boarding schools in the 1920s and 30s, and the teachers at the boarding schools cut all of your hair, take away all of your traditional clothing, put you in clothing they think you should be in and try and turn you into a white person. What does that do to your identity? What does that do to your psyche? What does that do to your sense of self? That's what Susan was up against as well. And part of the genius of Susan LaFleche is that she was able to create and nurture this bicultural identity and she was able to walk that bicultural tightrope virtually all of her life without ever falling off. A very, very difficult thing to do then and a very difficult thing to do now. Yeah, she spoke fluent English and fluent French and fluent Omaha and Oto and Pawnee. She could quote Shakespeare at length and love Shakespeare. She presided at Christian funerals. She taught Sunday school. She also was one of the powwow dance leaders every summer during the traditional powwow. She embroidered Native American dresses and earrings. So she kept one foot in each world all of her life, which made her a better doctor because she also cared for hundreds of white settlers and delivered their babies and also kept the other foot firmly grounded in the culture of her people and has become an extraordinary role model for Omaha Indian girls right now on the Omaha reservation, which is the poorest county in Nebraska with the highest suicide rate. And her pictures are all over the hallway. She's talked about in class. And she's become this, this really potent role model. You can't be what you can't see. And these young girls. So 
this was an extraordinary feat and ability of her to be able to traffic as almost effortlessly as she did in these two very different worlds, a white world and a red world, and get the best out of both without ever toppling over and not knowing who she was because her identity had been had, had been stolen from her. And that's still a major issue in native country right now and and, and many other places uh, besides uh, the reservations. So I think I've gone on a little bit longer than I planned to and I apologize for that. But um, those, I just wanted to make sure that those three themes, uh, which are really important to understanding uh, who this extraordinary woman was, that I, that I got them out there. And uh, I thank you very much for uh, listening. And I think the uh, arrangement was that um, I would uh, chat about 35 minutes or so, and then I would open up the discussion to a series of brilliant questions. <laughs> so, um, Joe, I yes. just, you didn't have an illustrated talk per se, but you illustrated the talk for me with your words. And I can just picture Dr. Picote in her Buffalo um, coat Whoa. and, uh, you know, just, you know, having a panic attack. It, it's remarkable. And what a wonderful way to, um, Open Women's History Month. So we do have a question from Dr. Robert Hicks. And uh, let's see, he says, um, could you recall a segment of her diary or correspondence that particularly encapsulated her sense of self and her sense of mission? Well, there, I could not pinpoint like a specific paragraph, but I would say that her, her diaries are peppered with anecdotal evidence and incidents that flesh that out. Uh, she talks about, she, she was obsessed in a good way with the children of the reservation. And she has many, many diary entries talking about how they are the future of the tribe. They are the future of her people. And we have to do everything we can as a people to try and give them a solid foundation. She, so when she started the first, she started the first uh, library on the Omaha reservation in, in the 1890s, which was unheard of on Native American reservations. She started a, a library for children. Uh, there are all kinds of pithy, anecdotes about what she was up against trying to bring a whole different health mentality to the Omaha people. The first thing that she banned when she got back from medical school was the, the tribal, the, the drinking cup, the tribal drinking cup, which 